this morning. It is a blessing to be able to gather together in person. Amen. 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 That's still, y'all, we got to work on this. <laughs> we need to be rejoicing that we're able to be in person together. We encourage others to come and be a part of this. It's Amen. a blessing to be in God's house. Amen. 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 Doesn't it just make you feel better to smile this morning? And a, a shout out. Amen. Well, it is a blessing. I encourage you to grab your Bibles. You probably know where we're headed this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses. See, I almost didn't know where we were this morning either. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 is where we're going to be this morning. So if you want to grab your Bible and be turning there, that's exactly where we're going to find ourselves. And so... In God's Word, we can always find a, a bit of light for what's going on in our world. If we look around us, we look at our government, we look at everything that's happening in our nation, and we, we like to, don't worry, I'm not going political here, okay? I'm not saying anything about Democrats, Republicans, Independents, any of that stuff. We're in a mess, okay? Just as a world, worldwide. Politically, it doesn't matter. You set all that stuff off to the side. The reason we're in such a mess is we've taken our eyes off of God's Word. We've taken our eyes off of God, where He wants us to be. We're actually going to be in verses 13 through 17 of 1 Peter this morning. Peter is known for probably being the most outspoken of the disciples. He's probably one of the ones that, that he was the hardest for Jesus to, to get a handle on, to keep it, his mouth shut sometimes. Because Peter had that sailor mentality. He didn't care what he said. When he said he was rough around the edges, he was just one of these good old boys, okay? He could have hung out wherever he wanted to, and, and he just, but, but he was somebody that Jesus made his special project, I believe. He pulled Peter over here, and he did a miraculous work in Peter's life. Peter was changed for the best because of what Jesus did. In our text this morning, Peter continues to instruct Christians how they're to live. He gives them solid advice of what God expects of them in interacting with other people. Interacting not just with their fellow citizens, but interacting with the government who's in charge. And so God expects us to, to listen to this as well. Uh, how to interact with positions, those in positions of authority. The old Peter... Now, <laughs> He probably would have given a lot of different instructions if he was allowed to, to telling people how to act towards the government or telling people how to act towards other people. Before coming to Christ, before becoming a true believer, Peter would have just worn them out. He would have taken them out to the woodshed and straightened things out with them. But no, after Jesus got a hold of him and after it clicked with Peter, when Peter really got turned on for Christ, when the flame started to grow in his heart, and he started living for Christ, and he realized what Jesus had done on Calvary, then it all started making sense, and Peter was changed, and even his speech was different to people. And so God used Peter to write this passage to them and to us today. In this passage, we have a group of people. They've been severely persecuted for their faith. They've been, the government has been all over them. They've made it as hard as they can make it on them. Worship-wise and gathering-wise and all of this, society has isolated them. They've taken, made it more. They had to leave their homes, flee and leave everything they knew. They, they've made it so difficult for them to be a follower of Christ that it, they were almost ready to throw in the towel. So they needed somebody to give them some encouragement and a reminder of who they are. And so God used Peter to tell them this through this passage. These were outcasts by society. But yet Peter encourages them to do just the opposite of what they really were feeling. He said, look, you don't need to give up on all of this. You don't need to be discouraged by how the government is treating you. You, you don't have to worry about all that because God's got it under control. But how should they act? How should we react towards those making life so difficult? How should they react to a government that was putting the pressure on them? Well, if you have your place in your Bible this morning, stand with me if you're able. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 is where we'll begin. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible this morning. It says, Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme.
supreme authority, or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Would you join me in prayer? Father, in this moment, we ask that you would just fill this place. We ask that you remove every distraction from every heart and every mind this morning, that we will truly see you and sense your presence and hear your word today. To hear your voice, that still small voice that calls out to each of us in this moment, in your house, in this moment in time. Father, have your will in your way. Speak to us today. Give us a message that's undeniably from you that will change our hearts, Lord, as we leave this place that we can say that it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for all that you're about to do, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, if you look at verses 13 through 15, we find some important words that Peter uses to instruct the people how they are to act. He instructs them and he instructs us to, first of all, submit to both national and local authorities. Now, usually that's not too difficult for us to do, is it? And we don't like uh, April the 15th, it's a date that we don't like too much because that's usually the time that most people have a problem with the government. That's tax day. We don't like filling out paperwork and sending it to the government and all of that. Not by, not by any stretch of the imagination. But we do it. Why? Because it's the law. We don't like following rules and regulations a lot of times. We wonder why do we have all this stuff? Why do we have it in place? Why do we have to have speed limits? And why do we have to have uh, rules about where we can go and what we can do and what we can't do? So rules are not always negative, though. Laws are not always negative. Laws are necessary. Laws are essential for order. The first word that Peter uses in this text is the word submit. Now, to submit, when I say submit, people don't like that word. We always joke about the, the women and the men. They always get to that passage of Scripture where it's wives submit to your husbands and husbands submit to your wives and, and all of this. We don't, we don't like that word submit because it has a negative connotation to it. It, it means to, to give in sometimes in our mind. We think it's a negative thing. But no, it's not. To submit, it's a strong word, but it couldn't have been very easy for these people to hear these words. Knowing that it was the government that was causing all of their strife, or a lot of their strife. It was the government that had caused their troubles. It was the government that forced them to leave their homes. It was the government that was putting extreme pressure on them. But the word submit that Peter uses here, it's an imperative that strongly commands them to follow and do what God expects them to do. You see, we forget sometimes that our submission is to be to God first. If we submit to God, then submitting to the government is not the issue. It's not as much of an issue. We're commanded to do the same thing that these people are to do today. We're to submit to the laws of the government. But notice another important word. It says every. Let's just look at it here. In verse 13 of our text. It says here, submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. We are to submit to every ordinance, every institution, all of them. Every level of government here. And I know what you're thinking because I think the same thing sometimes. Why do we have such structure? Why do we have to bow down to so much of this, these, these rules and regulations? Why would such instruction be so strongly commanded? Why would Jesus insist this, or God insist this through Peter? Why would he be telling these people to do this knowing that these people are being mistreated? Why would he strongly suggest this to us or strongly command us to do this? Well, here's why. Without law-abiding citizens, guess what? We would have chaos. If we didn't have 
have an example of what abiding by the law looked like, it would be pandemonium. That's a good Ray Stevens word. It was pandemonium. But anyway, to not obey the law causes problems. Just look on the news and look at some of the things that are happening with folks not obeying the law. What happens? Folks become terrified. Folks become scared to get out of their homes. Folks become afraid to, to just live normal lives. There's chaos that occurs when laws are not abided by. And so we don't want that. No one can walk the streets safely. Without law and without keeping the law, there can be no society, no community, no life together. There would be isolation. That sound familiar these days? We've been isolated. We've just gotten a little taste of isolation of what it would be through, and this was through a virus. Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to compare that to, to this, but in a way I am because the isolation is the same. If there's chaos going on, folks are going to isolate themselves. They're going to run from it. They're going to be afraid of it. They're not going to get back in the fray. No society, no community, no life together, nothing to form a bond between all people. But the law does something. It unites and unifies the people. Why? Look at it. If, if the speed limit says 55, okay, who has to drive 55? No, wait a minute. Who should drive 55? Is, it, is anybody exempt from driving 55? Does anybody get a pass? To where they don't have to drive 55, other than maybe a policeman that's chasing somebody down. No, we're all, the, the law unites us all under the same standard. We're all expected to drive 55. So there's a unity there, even through the law, this bond between all people. It unites us. If you have law, you must have those that enforce it as well. Now, I thank God for the policemen for what they do in our nation to keep the peace, to keep the safety, to, to enforce the laws that are on the books. Without them, there would definitely be chaos. Now, are there some that are bad apples? Sure. You're going to have that. Why? Because, okay, we have some Christians that are bad apples. Would you agree? Sometimes people are people. They're not all going to be 100% what they're supposed to be. But we need enforcement of law. We need enforcement of God's word. As believers, we're to enforce the commandments that God has put in place and given to us. Here's the thing. God does not approve of chaos. He doesn't approve of chaos in our personal lives. He doesn't approve of chaos in society. He doesn't. That's not his plan. Because we serve a God of order. We serve a detail-oriented God. And if you don't believe that God's a God of, of details, take a leaf off of a tree. Flip it over and look at the backside. Look at all the little intricate veins in that leaf. God took the time to design that leaf with every little vessel in that leaf to carry food to that leaf so that we can have the the pretty green leaves. And, and then the, later in the fall when they change colors, he blesses us with that as well. And he blesses us with being able to rake, rake all of those up <laughs> after they fall. But maybe not such a blessing there. But anyway, God is interested in the minute details of our lives just as much as he is that leaf. If he took the time to design that leaf that's just going to hang on that tree until it falls, how much more do you think he cares about you? How much more interest did he put into developing you in your life? Every person that's born into this world, God intricately designed. We serve a God of order. He desires for us to live in a world that's full of love, full of joy, full of peace, full of law and order. And so therefore, it's important for the believers to step up and live out the example of following the law. Following God's example, God's expectation. Why is that so important? Well, we're supposed to live it out for the lost world to see. If we don't live out the example of what Jesus wanted to accomplish when he came to earth, what's the point? The lost world will never see God's love if they don't see it through us. 
We're expected to do that. That just, it comes with the territory. Every civil ruler is allowed to come into place by God. Do you realize that this morning? No matter who it is, good or bad, they are in place because God allowed it to take place. God allowed that person to take the throne. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, in Old Testament law, when the kings were put in place, they had all great kings, didn't they? Every one of them just, every one of them fell in line. They just did exactly what they were supposed to do. Every time they had a new king, he was just a perfect example of who God wanted, right? No, no not hardly. No, you would have good kings. You would have bad kings. The good kings did what was expected by God. And God blessed the people through that king. Then you'd have a bad king come along and he would undo everything that the king before him had done. He tried to. He would make it hard on the people. And he just created chaos in the land. But God still managed to protect the people even under that bad king. He still managed to bless the people who were obedient to him. The ones who wound up losing a blessing were the ones that took their eyes off of God and his expectations. They were not faithful to what God had called them to be. And so that's why they lost that blessing. And so every leader that's in place, God placed them there. The structure of government, it's ordained by God. Whether we like it or not, we need that structure. It's ordained by Him. He uses those that are in office to bring about His will. You see, sometimes it takes some bad apples in the mix to bring out the good ones, to make them step up, to help them to develop a backbone. Sometimes God allows things to happen in our lives to develop our spiritual backbone, to help us to stand up as Christians for what's right, to stand up for his law, to follow him and not follow man. So here we are. There are three institutions ordained by God. Here they are. You may want to write these down. First of all, it's the family. God ordained the family before he did anything else. The family, the church, and then the government. See, the government falls low on the list there. It's number three. The family, the church, and the government. So if we live our lives in front of our family the right way, then we live our lives in front of the church the right way and, and in front of the world, then we're going to be taking care of the government. Government will take care of itself. Because if we're living the way God expects us to live, everything will fall into place. That's the problem. We don't want to live according to God's word sometimes. We want to live according to our word. We have our own version of God's word. We make it say what we want it say, to say sometimes. We, we change things up to, well, God didn't really expect me to do that. That's just too hard to follow. No. He wouldn't have given it to us if we couldn't follow it. We can't follow it on our own. We have to have the Holy Spirit's help. And so that's why he encourages us to be faithful to him, to be obedient to him. We're to submit to these authorities because they've been sent by God. And their position is set up so that they might execute justice on God's behalf. You see, when God put the judges in place in the Old Testament, their purpose was to bring about justice. They, they were set up so that people would have a source to go to. They would have somebody to go to to settle disputes so that it, there would be justice. It would be using God's word to determine what justice should be. That's how we're supposed to be doing today. We're supposed to be living our lives according to God's word and causing justice to take place. If, if we would just live according to God's word, justice would be there. We wouldn't have to have any of this wokeness that you hear about in the news. You wouldn't have to hear anything about all, all of this social justice stuff. No. If we were living the way God wants us to live, you wouldn't have to worry about any of that junk. Okay? That's a good Greek term for all of it is junk. God's word settles it, how we are to live. If we follow that, everything else will work itself out. And so we all know that justice doesn't always happen because we have some people that don't want to go by God's plan. But all throughout history, God has still managed, as I've said, to use good leaders and bad leaders to bring about his will, to accomplish what he wills in our world. And our job is not to approve or disapprove. We do, though, don't we? 
We pick who we like and who we don't like. We, we choose among, we have the right to vote and voice our opinions. And some people say, well, you know, you're not supposed to, to mix politics and religion. Well, I can agree with that to a certain point, but here's the thing. If we as Christians don't stand up for what's right by God's word, we're going to lose this nation. If we don't go by what God says in choosing who we choose to elect and all of this, if we don't seek God's will over everything else, we're in a pitiful situation. We're going to be in a mess. We fall away from God and we're falling away from everything else. We can't expect God to bless us if we get away from what he's told us to do. Now you see what I did there? I didn't go Republican. I didn't go Independent. I didn't go Democrat. I didn't go anywhere across the bay because that doesn't matter. The party does not matter. What matters is going according to what God says. His standards. We're not to approve or disapprove, but rather to obey God. Notice something else here. What, what doing this accomplishes in verse 15. And if we obey God in verse 15, let's just look at verse 15 again. Verse 15, it, it says here plainly and clearly, here, for it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Good behavior silences the critics. Good behavior and living the way God expects us to live knocks the legs out from under the critics. Anybody that comes against you as a believer, if you're a believer and they're not and they're trying to attack you, if you're living the way God has told you to live, they don't have a leg to stand on. They don't have any ground for argument there. And God will take care of that. It pleases God when we are good citizens. When we live as good citizens, God is pleased. And it shows the world what it looks like. It shows the world what it's supposed to look like. Let's see what else Peter instructs in verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 and 17 here, he says, Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. We find here that Peter instructs his listeners and us to live as free citizens, yet as servants of God. Live as free citizens, but as servants of God. So we have freedom in being a Christian. We have freedom in following God's law. We have freedom in being a believer this morning. But yet we are to be bound to God, being a servant to Him. And it's serving Him out of love. It's not forced servitude. We're not being made to serve God. God doesn't force his hand upon us and make us be a good citizen, does he? He doesn't cause us to, to make these decisions. He gives us the opportunity to make these decisions because he loves us that much. He gives us free will to choose between two different things, two, two ways of doing, either his way or the other way. And so we have that free will. And living as a good citizen makes God happy. It's important for us to remember we're not living for the government. We're supposed to obey the law of the land, of course. But if we think that the government is in control of everything, no, it's not. Okay, the government has rules and regulations that we're, we're encouraged and we're uh, commanded to follow. But the government does not have the final say. You know who does? God. We have forgotten that. We've gotten away from that. Because God is the ultimate authority. That's the one that we're supposed to work towards pleasing. Not the government. Not man-made rule. We're not intended to please man. God intends for us to please Him. To bring blessing and honor and glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because guess what? Our very lives are in His hand. The government doesn't control when you live when you die. Now, they might, at some point, they may force the issue. And uh, some governments around the world, yes, they're taking people's lives. But only because God has allowed that to, to take place. Now, I'm not saying God ordained it or blessed it. But people are going to be people. God is still in control no matter what. Just because people make a bad decision doesn't mean 
that God is not in control. Think about your own life. How many people in this room have ever sinned? Almost every hand. Okay. <laughs> all right. Everybody in this room has sinned. The Bible says everybody has sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God said that he sent his only begotten son. And whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave opportunity to overcome that sin. He made a way for us all to be forgiven. Just because we made some bad choices and we committed sin that didn't please God doesn't mean that the ball game's over. It may be the bottom of the night and, and runners on and, and two strikes against that batter, but we're coming up to the plate and God says, look, you've still got a chance. You've got one more pitch coming at you. And here we are. God is ready to make that happen. Our very lives are in his hand. Why don't we give him honor and glory with our lives? We should fear God's wrath long before we fear the wrath of the government. We should fear God more than we do our next door neighbor. We should fear God more than we do taxes. We should fear God more than we should fear a bad health diagnosis. We should fear God more than anything. Now, I'm not saying be afraid of God. I'm saying be respectful of God's power. Be respectful of who he is. Be respectful of, of what he has control of. We are to live as the servants of God, not servants of ourselves, not servants of our own ideas. We are to serve him and honor the calling that he's placed on our life <clears throat> because he has put a calling on every believer's life. He's put a call on every person's life. And every, every lost person, every saved person has a call that's issued from God. Do you realize that? God has called every individual in this room, every individual around this world, every individual that hasn't even been born yet, there's a call on their life. And it's up to that individual to answer that knock at their heart's door, to serve him. Peter lays out our duties. As citizens in these verses, here they are. The first thing that he lays out here is we have a duty as believers to honor all men. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Steve? Are we supposed to throw a party in their honor? Or are we supposed to put them on a pedestal? Or what are we supposed to do to, to honor all men? Well, we're to look at others as fellow citizens with all the rights and privileges that we enjoy. Look at every person in, on the face of this earth as your equal. Not anybody that's beneath us, not anybody that's above us. It, there's a level playing field because the cross level the ground that we walk on. We should see all men, all people the same. The people that Peter was addressing, they were surrounded by pagan worship. Man, that must have hit them right in the teeth when he threw that out to them. You're going to have to see these people as having the same value that God values you with. You must look at these people who are involved in this false worship and idol worship and all this the same way that God looks at you. Let's bring it home. We're to look at lost people the same way that God looks at us. Because guess what? We too, and if we're a believer this morning, we too were lost at one time. And we didn't know our way around. We didn't know who God was. We didn't know what God had to offer. But God says here through Peter, honor all men. Look at them the same. These people were corrupt. They were sinful. Sinners are going to act like sinners. Sinners are going to be involved in sinful behavior. It takes place. It's part of it. It's the nature of the beast. But Peter says here, just because they're involved in all of that, don't stop loving them because God has not stopped loving them. God sent his one and only son so that they too could be saved. Even though society was full of sin around them, the people committing that sin were still created by God. Folks, that's the same that happens today. When we look around and we see folks involved in sin, we should not be the first ones to say, can you believe what they're doing? Look at how they're acting. Look at how they're living. Well, I'd never do that. No. No. We're to look at them through the eyes of God and love them and pray for them and share the gospel with them. The same way that God allowed you to be exposed to the gospel. Because their soul is just as important to God as that of yours. 
All people are to be held in a place of esteem and honor because God sees them that way. And folks, that's part of our problem today. We look at lost people through our own eyes instead of God's eyes. We look at lost people today like, well, I sure hope somebody gets the message through to them one of these days. It's, uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that, but I, I, just, I, I just can't do that. God says you can. God expects us to. God expects us to reach out to them in love. So here it is. We need to look through God's eyes. We're to honor all people, not give up on them. We're, we're guilty of giving up on people long before God gives up on them. Well, next, Peter gives us another duty. The second duty is to love the brothers and sisters. Here's the good part. As believers, we have brothers and sisters in Christ. We have fellow brothers and sisters. Our family gets bigger every time a person gets saved. Isn't that great? It's not just people in this room. It's people in other churches. It's people down the block. It's people around the world. I have fellow believers that are in Romania. I have fellow believers that are in Taiwan. I have fellow believers in Brazil. All over the place. All over the world, we have brothers and sisters in Christ. There's unity that comes from Jesus dying on the cross. Being a part of the family of God. It means we're to love all believers. We're to love the church because God loves the church. The church is not brick and mortar. The church is people. The church is every person that has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior and lives for Him. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're to love them as family. God expects us to go a step further, though, than just loving them and a step further than respecting and honoring them. He desires for us to do a few things. One of these things is to teach one another. You realize that's part of our Christian duty? To help each other grow in spiritual maturity. Not just expect everybody to do the best they can and get along on their own. No. He says for us to teach one another. To support one another. To be there for one another. To help and protect one another. To fellowship with one another. We don't have a problem with this one very much. Everybody likes to gather around the table and fellowship and have a good time and have a good meal and good fried chicken. I don't know if a Baptist pastor out there that doesn't like fried chicken. I don't know if a Baptist out there that doesn't like fried chicken. If they don't like it, well, something's wrong with them, okay? We need to check their salvation, but no. I'm just kidding on that part. But anyway, we all like fellowship. And he says here to, to fellowship with one another. And it means more than just gathering around the table. It means talking with one another. It means associating with one another. Fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ no matter where they are. Do you get that? Fellow brothers and sisters at Walmart, Dollar General, the gas station, the grocery store, at school, at soccer practice, all these places. To fellowship with them. Enjoy one another's company. And here's another one. To pray and to worship with one another. I don't think we do enough of that in our society today. As fellow believers, we, we're kind of afraid to call on brothers and sisters. Until it gets so bad that we have to do it. Why don't we make that a normal part of our lives? Every day of, hey, can you pray with me about something today? Call that brother or sister in Christ and say, hey, look, I, I, I'm, I'm just having something going on in my life right now. I want you to partner with me to pray. Why don't we do that on a, a regular basis so that when those storms of life come up, it's already in place. We have a support system there. Instead of letting it get so bad that we wait until the last moment to call on somebody, we feel like we're going to uh, impose on them by asking them to pray for us. Folks, we've been commanded to do this. God's word says do it. He didn't say choose not to. So here's another thing here. God wants us to be personally involved in each other's lives. Uh-oh. To be personally involved in each other's lives. Now, this doesn't mean that you've got to know everybody's business. <laughs> this is not a gossip factory. God does not give us permission to gossip here. What he does say is be involved enough in each other's lives that you know what's going on. Share with one another. Don't be afraid to share what's going on in your life. The good times, the bad times, all of that so that we can build one another up. And we can be strong and healthy. 
Everybody's concerned about herd immunity. How they rate us as a bunch of cows, I've never figured out. You, know, you hear it on the news all the time about COVID vaccinations and hoping that we will reach herd immunity. Well, folks, we need some herd immunity in our spiritual family to be spiritually healthy. When we do what Peter is telling these people to do, we will find that healthiness, that herd immunity. The enemy can't strike down all of us at the same time. There's strength in numbers. So be personally involved in each other's lives. I love this quote I found in studying this week. And here's what it says. Love is the very opposite of criticizing, backbiting, grumbling, murmuring, and being divisive. Let me read that one more time. Love is the very opposite of criticizing, backbiting, grumbling, murmuring, and being divisive. Think about what you hear in our world today. There's criticism. There's backbiting. There's grumbling. There's murmuring. There's griping, complaining. And everybody's divided. Everybody wants to take a side. Everybody wants to, to choose sides. Well, that's not what God wants us to do. We, he wants us to take a side, all right, but it's his side he wants us to take. We're to love the brotherhood of all believers everywhere. And it begins with loving God. And if we do that, again, the rest will come naturally. Picture it on the, as a picture of the cross. If you look at the standards of the cross, the first thing we have to nail down is that relationship between God and man. Between us and God. It's that upright that holds everything together. If we do this, if we take care of this beam of the cross... Then he applies this other beam going this way. You know what that is? That's the relationship with everybody else. The ground is level at the foot of the cross because God made it that way intentionally. Work on your relationship with God first and the relationship with others falls into line. We're to love the brotherhood and love lost people and love everyone the same to honor mankind. Well, there's another duty that Peter brings up, and that is we are to fear God. It does not mean that we are to shake and tremble and be scared of God. But brothers and sisters, we should have an honest respect of our maker. Because he has the power to take us out at any moment. If we're not pleasing to him, we've lost that fear of God. We've lost the respect for God. In our world, we've lost the, the, the respect that God could take us out at any moment. He could call it to an end in a moment's notice. We ought to live in fear of an almighty God, of what would happen if we disobey him. It ought to break our heart when we break God's heart by sinning. But I think we've gotten away from fear and respect. We've allowed the world to impact us instead of us impacting the world to what's happened. This is where we've gone. And disobeying God has consequences. I think that's why we're seeing some of the, the downfall of our society now. Is we have forgotten who we are and whose we are. We've gotten away from God's word. We want somebody else to tell us what it says instead of getting in it and finding out for ourselves and living by it. Matthew 10 and 28 says this. Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, that's the message that we need to share with folks today is choosing something other than God leads only to hell. There is a holy and a righteous God. It's real. Heaven is real and hell is real. And you're going to choose who you serve one of these days whether you like it or not. If we focus on obeying God, we'll be good citizens. It's the most important duty that we have. And Peter gives one more duty in verse 17. He says that we are to honor the emperor. Sounds like the line out of Star Wars or something. <laughs> honor the emperor. Or, in another way that he puts it, is the supreme authority of the nation. Whoever's in charge is what he's saying here. Honor whoever is in charge. For this people... It was a, a totally extreme challenge because Nero was on the throne. 
Nero was the ruler of all the Roman government, and he was just an awful guy. This was a bad dude. He, he was just a rough individual. He was heartless. He's one of the most feared rulers of their day. But Peter told the people, he said, I know he's rough, I know he's bad, I know he's terrible, I know he can take your life in a heartbeat just over nothing, but still honor him. Why? Because Peter knew God allowed Nero to rise to power. Why did God allow Nero to rise to power? I don't know. They don't know. But I think part of it might have been to shape the people into reality. God has a tendency to allow things like that to happen, so it shakes us and wakes us up. You remember what happened back in September the 11th a few years ago? Terrible tragedy for our nation. The next day, the churches were full. Where are we now as a nation? We've lost that respect. But Peter told the people to honor Nero. They didn't say throw a parade for him. They didn't say do this. They said just respect his position. Respect his authority. Because he is a bad dude. He can do what he wants to. But above that, honor God. Listen to God and you won't have to worry about Nero. God will take care of you. What we must always keep in mind is that no matter who sits on the throne of the nation, God is still in control. It doesn't matter who's running things because God is running things. He's in control. We have to do our best to put forth the example of how to live in front of a lost and dying world. You see, I think that's the challenge that God gives us today. How are you going to live when I turn up the heat on you? How are you going to represent me when I put a little pressure on you? When I allow the world to come in and infiltrate the church, what are you going to do? How are you going to react to that? How are you going to respond? Are you going to be faithful to me or are you going to cave and do what the world wants you to do? God is still in control. We have to do our best to present Jesus to a lost and dying world, even if it means honoring someone we don't necessarily agree with. What it all boils down to is no matter what, God will always work things out for what's best. Romans 8.28 reminds us that God works all things out for our good. He makes all things possible. When there seems to be no way, God will make a way. And he'll always work things out for those who love him, who are the call according to his purpose. Live as free citizens. Yet as servants of God, when a, when a person receives Jesus as his Savior, this person subjects himself to God above all else. We forget that. We forget that when we become a follower of Christ, we are surrendered to Jesus and following him, not everybody else. If we follow Jesus, we'll be following what he wants us to follow. He'll work everything else out. Live as free citizens, yet as servants of God. If man's law stands against God's law, the believer obeys God rather than man. You see, God will take care of it. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to be concerned about that. And I, I really don't like that word worry. Because the Bible says to worry is a sin. I, I like the word concern because concern means you're doing something about it. Worry is just wasted energy. That's why God calls it a sin. You're doing something that's counterproductive. And so here we are. When a person subjects himself to God above all other laws and all everything, then we don't have to worry about what the law says because we'll be following it. If we're looking out for following God above all, we don't have to think about disobeying the law. But we have to keep in mind, too, that it doesn't give us license to use this freedom to act maliciously toward the government. Just because we're a Christian and God says you're not supposed to do this doesn't give us the right to commit a sin against somebody that's acting differently than we expect them to. We can't use our Bible as a weapon against folks. Well, Brother Steve, uh, the Bible is our sword spiritually, isn't it? Yes, it is. But it is a sword that is against sin. It's not against somebody. We lose track of that too. 
We try to use it against people instead of sin. God never intended his word to be used against people. He intended his word to tell us the truth between right and wrong. To love the sinner but hate the sin. So living a submitted life is what God expects. To receive Jesus by surrendering to him. And I ask you this morning, have you made that commitment? Have you submitted to him? That was the title of my lesson this morning. My, my sermon today is living a submitted life. Have you submitted to God above all? Are you being a good citizen today? Have you made the commitment to serve him? Because being a good citizen on earth, it all begins with securing your citizenship in heaven. We've talked about for the last couple of weeks uh, through this study how that our residency is not here on this earth. Our residency as a believer is in heaven. I hope that you have secured that place in heaven today. If you haven't, I encourage you to consider that today. I encourage you to, to come to Jesus. Live a submitted life. Submit to the government, but above all, submit to the Almighty. Would you join me in prayer? Father, today we thank you that you're such a loving God. We thank you that you are so patient with us. We thank you that you've been patient with us as a nation. You've been patient with us as individuals. And Father, we ask your forgiveness today for the flaws and the faults that we have. We lay them at your feet today. I pray that if there's someone here that does not know Jesus, that's never surrendered to him, <coughs> That today would be the day they make a decision to follow you. Father, we ask that you would bless the leaders of our land. Good, bad, or otherwise, God, you're still in control. We ask you to bless them, help them to make wise decisions. Decisions that are based upon your word. But Father, bringing it back even closer to home, we pray that you'd help us to do the very same thing. To make decisions based upon your word. Don't let us leave here today without being changed by the truth of your word. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask that you have your will and have your way during this time of invitation. Your invitation when you command us to respond to what you've laid upon our hearts. We love you, Father. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.